an amazing way of seeing ourselves. The reason we've been asking this question is because everybody thinks that they do take responsibility for their lives. Their responsibility is a very, very difficult thing to see in the mirror, especially in ourselves. Uh, but as we've continued on with this series, we've discovered that our irresponsibility eventually becomes someone else's responsibility. It's not a solo thing. Irresponsibility impacts people that we are connected with, regardless if it's in a marriage, a family, a community, a workplace, a church, or any other type of community. You know, if you think back, you think back when you were a kid, and it's, it's amazing how this thing has changed over the years. Uh, at one point or another, you said to your parents, that's not fair. Which the grown-ups respond, life isn't fair. And the truth is that life isn't fair, and there's something in all of us that wants life to be fair, or we think it should. And I think if we're being honest, most of us would confess that we are primarily concerned about fairness when our piece of the pie ends up being the smallest. And we're looking at the pie, not as we have done in the past. I, I used the example of a marriage, and the counselor said, go out a piece. Uh, and drew that circle and said, show me your piece of the pie that's supposed to be out. That's not what we're talking here uh, about here. We're talking about um, how much we have or think we have. It's amazing how many testimonies we hear where the person says, I wanted this and I got the opposite. I didn't think I deserved it, yet it ended up being exactly what I needed. Maybe you said that. I wanted this and I got the opposite. When I get a large piece of pie, usually that person that has that large piece doesn't care too much about what's fair. When I get a large piece of the pie, I'm just saying, God, you are so good, you're so forgiving, you're so loving. Thank you for this wonderful life that you gave to me. Um, usually those people don't think about all the other people that got the smaller part of the pie uh, that are out there and I'm not saying we all think this but a lot of those people are saying you know my life is so unfair I prayed I worked hard I tried hard to do what was right look at my life some people might even blame God when we say life isn't fair, what we're really saying is life isn't even. Well, I think that life should be even. And that, that goes through my mind. I, I, that goes through all of our minds. Like we, we think life should be, be even, but, but that's impossible for that to happen. There is no way for things to be even. And here's why this is important for us to look at. The unfairness of life, the unevenness of life, can quickly become an excuse for our irresponsibility. If I don't get a big piece of the pie, can you expect me to be a responsible person? Why should I even try? I get a little piece of the pie. He's got a big piece of the pie. He should be the one trying. Why go the extra mile if I don't get the benefits? I have every right, or at least in my mind, in the world to walk away from my responsibilities because somebody else got my fair share. That's exactly why socialism will not work. 
But we can't do that, especially as believers. Irresponsibility eats a hole in our soul, and we begin to spiral out of control. You're the one who will be most negatively impacted by your own irresponsibility. And you're never going to really be happy with you. Irresponsible people ultimately aren't really happy. Because irresponsibility always, always creates conflicts with those people around us. And, and also conflicts inside of us. Because we know. And as much as we use excuses, as much as we try to shift the blame, we know. And that conflict lies within us. Benjamin Franklin, he said this, he that is good at making excuses is seldom good at anything else. He's describing the downward spiral of irresponsibility that comes when we view our lives as unfair. I want us to look at a video. I don't know what you think about this guy, but I thought he was great on the money next week at South Washington. And so Paul's going to play a video for us. Uh, and it's very short, but listen to his words. Right in the mind. The most important lessons in life that you should know is to remember to have an attitude of gratitude, of humility. Understand that a gift comes from, it's not mine, it's been given to me. Use what I have, use what you have to help others. You know, on your last day, you can't take it with you. But you can be there. You'll never say that you all fly a curse. Very short to the point, but it hits the nail on the head. It's people with the short end of the stick who sometimes tend to be irresponsible. They might just be um, actually right who God wants them. We've all seen people with a larger piece of the pie become responsible with what they have. We love people like that. And we should. Um, just read the news. The more money you have, the more the more we have to be responsible with what we have. And it's amazing to me if you do read the news that the more money some of these people have, the more money they tend to waste. <laughs> it's just with time too. The more the more time you have, the more time you waste. The more of anything you have that you don't need, the more you waste. We generally, uh, we're generally irresponsible with things when we have extra. If we're not careful, we can be just as irresponsible as the person on the other side of the register. I mean, again, we've read over and over and over that these people that have millions and kind of billions, they squander. I mean, some of these, some of these actors and actresses are scratching their head. I mean, why did you do my eye? We wonder how on earth did he or she do that with that much money? The issue isn't how to make life fair. The real issue is what we're going to do with the hand that we've got. What are we going to do with the lives that God has given us? And that's what Washington, that's what Washington is saying. It's unbelievable to us. The more you focus on the fairness or the unevenness of life, the more you're tempted to excuse irresponsibility because of what someone else has done or hasn't done. I want to look at the parable of responsibility. I know it is the parable of repentance. And it's found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 39. Let me take it bit by bit. And all of this, all of this stuff is what Jesus taught over 2,000 years ago. And it's amazing how relevant it is right now. We're going to look at this in the book of 
that. So in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is telling parables about the kingdom of God right here, what the kingdom of God is like. And in the midst of these, he tells this story about the unevenness, the unevenness and the unfairness of life. You might not have thought about it like that. To be honest with you, I don't think I ever did either, but uh, let's look at it from that angle. He offers us God's perspective on unevenness. And it's, it's pretty fascinating when you really think about it. But if you grew up in church, you might know the story in the parable of talents. And in the story, a talent is a measure of money. And Jesus took uh, something cultural for these first century uh, people and used it to teach a lesson about how God views the unevenness, unevenness of, in life. And keep in mind that whenever he told parables, usually he was telling them in extremes. They're not quite literal, but Jesus used this story to make his point clear. So let's look at this parable again. He starts off and he said, again, again, uh, will look like a man going on a journey, called his service and entrusted to his well to So again, Jesus is clearly speaking of extremes. This man left all his wealth to these three servants. The man leaves his wealth uh, for these servants to manage in a way that he would manage if he were there. That's what he was telling. And he says, to one, he gave five bags of gold. Again, a talent uh, was a measure of money. A talent of gold was worth uh, roughly about 20 years worth. So we're talking about that. Um, to another, he left two bags. And to another, one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. Now that's not even fair. Is it? They didn't get the same amount. How is that fair? Is it fair that somebody who owns wealth can then decide on how he wants to distribute it? Yeah, that's that's fair. He's a man who can decide on wealth. So one of life's lessons. I think that Jesus is trying to get across is everything is fair to someone. Let's continue. The man who received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave the five more bags. And by putting his money to, to work, we're, we're meant to understand that he went off, that he uh, put it in the bank, in the stock market, I'll call it the stock market, very sad. He traded his wealth for other things that caused that wealth to be <laughs> And he did this because he knew that that's what his master would expect from him. He had been given the money to manage. So he took that serious. So also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. Okay, so the second servant he managed his money. One bag, five bags, and he gained more. But the man who had received one bag went off the hole in the ground and killed his man. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts the with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought another five. Master, he said, You entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and now I will put you in charge of many things. Come share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came, Master. He said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, they have gained two more. And the master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, might this not seem a little unfair to the first servant? Might you be thinking, wait a minute, I had five, I made five more, I made ten. And you're going to put me in charge of many things, he only went from two to four. And now he gets 
put in charge of many things too. It's not you. It's in you. Maybe have to take that. What happens next is a great illustration of first century wine. Today we might come forward and call it complaining, making excuses, listen closely because the third servant begins to explain why he buried his money. And here's the interesting thing, he suddenly blames his master. Just like Adam suddenly blamed God for the reason he took and ate the apple, the one thing he took him to the floor, which he gave him some way to his face. That's kind of what's taking place here. And, and the truth is, this is what people tend to do when they act irresponsible. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. The servant is saying that the master is stuck. He doesn't leave any crumb on the table. He doesn't take no for an answer. So the servant is intimidated by the master and is anxious. And this is what he said. So I was afraid and I went out and dug your your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to me. Again, he's suddenly blaming his master for not being responsible for what has been and his master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. I thought that was very interesting. Wicked here also means worthless. And there's probably a better translation. The servant didn't invest the money because why would he be just lazy? I don't know. But he did the easiest thing, and then he blamed his master for his own laziness. So he continued on. So you knew that I harvest where I am not sold and gather where I am not scattered. See, well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Here, here's another surprise in this parable. The master says to his other servants, take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For those who have will be given more, and they will have an abundance. As for those who do not have, even what they have will be taken from them. For those who have been responsible with what they have, they're going to be given more. And the master says to the first two servants, Throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So if this guy who has had this incredible opportunity realizes he's blown it, blames his boss, and then is thrown out of this inner circle to a place where there's weeping and gnashing and teeth. I don't even want to go there. I don't want to talk about what that wants to do. A place of anger, a place of frustration, and the parable is just over. Jesus' point here is this. Everybody gets an uneven amount of opportunity, and everybody gets held for account or held accountable for what they do. Everybody has the privilege, everybody has the responsibility to somehow someday give an account of what they did with the uneven amount of opportunity. <clears throat> and this uneven amount of opportunity isn't even ours. And so Weston said, it's unknown to us. It's our responsibility to figure out how to leverage it to its maximum. So let's look at my second point. We are all baggers. So we'll put five baggers, two baggers, one bagger, four baggers. We all know some five bag people. They seem to get into the schools and People in the town that they recognize, and they often in the public sphere, and they make a lot of money, and they're beautiful, and they get those people on us. Everything seems to just come easy and naturally to them. But uh, if these five bag people aren't careful, 
they will take what they've been hearing for granted because it's just that easy. And then there are one bad people <clears throat> who really have to work hard to make their way to school. Maybe they're poor, maybe their parents got divorced when they're young and they have to go over and run their household. Maybe there was abuse in their lives or health problems. There are some who look at themselves in the mirror and think that they're not very attractive. They don't have good communication skills. They struggle socially. Life, life is tough. And these people know when they look around them, I, I, just, I just don't have a lot to go on for me. Especially when I can compare myself to these other people. It's too bad to find like this. And then there's most of us, probably in the middle. The true language. And the question for us is this what are we going to do with what we have? The tendency is to look at everyone else, at what they have and what they don't have. And we make excuses for what we will and what we won't do. This parable teaches us that we're to look at our own bag and decide how to leverage it to be exposed. We are to refuse to take that which we've been given for granted. That's what Jesus tells us. Don't take the man for the dignity. And I've given it with wisdom. Some of us might be a two bagger, maybe two bagger, maybe a five bagger, maybe a nine bagger. And vice versa. You ever think about the opposite? Maybe there's some five baggers. They could never be a one bagger. They wouldn't know how to deal with it. But we do tend to make excuses. I have several friends who have been very successful financially. I'm sure you do too. Some had their money handed to them. Some inherited. And as a result, they could retire young. They never really had to afford. Can I? Or they never really had to worry, can I afford this? Money was easy. But these men and these women still have this responsibility to carry and use wisely what they've been given. As Denzel Washington remember, it's a gift. It's something that has been given. We are one of the servants who has been given a bag or bags. I know one guy who decided to create an entire organization with the money he had. He devoted himself to mentoring and developing young men and women in the Christian world as effective leaders. His goal is, he said, I want to be broke at the time of my life. And he doesn't do this because he has to. He does it because he realizes he has been given so much and he wants to leverage it to its maximum. Another guy started a school in his 50s. He had all this extra time and this wealth and this energy and this leadership ability, and he gave it all to this school that he started for free. Because he realizes he's going to have to give an account for what he's done with what he's been given. And you know people like this. You've heard of people like this. We read stories of people like this. And it's it's thrilling. It's exciting to hear that some people are like that. And it's easy to be jealous of those who have been given much. But the truth is, we love to hear about guys like this. Women like this. They become our heroes. They've been given a lot but they did the best. And then you have the other people. My friend Matt, um, who was in his early 40s, I was talking about Matt before when I just passed away recently. And uh, he was in a terrible weapon accident. He broke his neck, paralyzed from the neck down, quadriplegic. 
I met Matt several years after he'd been the chair, where he was doing expert measures, uh, unable to move any part of his body next to his body. Uh, he had four door doors. Matt didn't sign up for that. That wasn't fair. Not to Matt. He was a good guy. He was a great teacher. He was a man who not just only loved life, he loved people. That wasn't a fair shake. For a little while, he struggled with it. And I only know that because he shared that with me. But I don't know when it exactly happened. One day he decided, and I don't know when that was, but he said, wait a minute, I can't spend the rest of my life making excuses and placing blame. I can't spend the rest of my life looking at whatever everybody else has, has and what they're doing with it. So he got busy. They started teaching PE and physical education. That was in awesome shape before the accident. And uh, he went back to Pete School and finished out his teaching career there. And then he began teaching health. And I was not a Christian at that point. I happened to be the first patient teacher. So Matt and I were able to have micro conversations as we saw each in the hallway. Um, and the thing that struck me about man is most people didn't understand and had no idea how much he was helping people behind the scenes. One day, he pulls into my driveway in this custom van with a new spade, and he comes out and hands me a check. So stamps were not a money. And he said, Dave, I know how hard it is raising kids. So this is for your college education. He didn't know anything about that. But that's the kind of guy that was. So for 30 years, sitting in a chair, Matt said, I'm going to do the best with what I can do. And I have no doubt that he did. I heard of a guy named Mario who came to the U.S. from Cuba with his sister. And he was 13 years old. And they came without their parents because their parents couldn't leave Cuba. And they went to live with their uncle who they never met. And Mario said he recalls that he and his sister would just hold each other every night and cry themselves to sleep. He didn't see his parents again until he was 35. Mario was a one bad person. But he decided not to make excuses. He got through high school. He went to the University of Miami where he excelled. He landed a great job afterwards in the telecom uh, company. And after he retired, he joined the board as the chair of the Charities Committee. And he serves in his community because he understands how people feel when they don't have anything. He also understands the fear that goes along with having only a few options. Mario is leveraging this season of his life to do something for other people. And that's what a one-bag person does when they decide to stop making excuses and stop asking for blame. And we've heard stories of Mario and Matt, and they often become greater heroes than those five bangers who gave it all away. But you know what? Their attitude is exactly the same. I've been doing this. And they've been responsible for it, for it and they used it because God came to me. I've been given this life and I'm going to use it to the best of I, that I can. None of them were looking to be a hero. 
just to be wise and responsible for what they can do. Whether it be little or a lot. And then there are the two great people, most of us. We've been given different opportunities, more than some people, less than other people. Our responsibility is to look at what we've been given and figure out how we can leverage it for all its worth for the sake of God's kingdom, because we're believers, hopefully. And if you're a Christian, just for the sake of doing something greater than yourself, living only for yourself is a waste of your life, and there is nothing inspiring about that. And that's part of the legacy that we leave behind. How we use what we've been given. George Bartles was a guy that I met when I first came over to Peekskill in 1993. George was, I guess, in his early 80s at that time. He lived a good life. He was much older. My wife at that time would on occasion, sing a solo. Every time she sang a solo, that afternoon, the next day, she would get a bouquet of flowers, sending them to the choir. And I, I remember uh, sitting down and talking with George, and George, he called that his ministry. He said, Dave, that's my ministry of encouragement. And he took it very serious. You did anything in church, the next day, there's a good chance delivery to some Jewish. Always thinking about other people. Always giving them the pat on the back. Always letting them know you blessed me. For you see what God has given you to serve me. Don't forget that. So, God is not trying to be even with us. He's just given us what he's given us to work with. You might have just an okay job. What are you going to do with that? You know what's interesting? Sometimes we say, I got an okay job until I get a better job. And what I found is that sometimes when people have the okay job and they give themselves to that, that becomes a better job. I watched people develop a love for something that I never knew they could love because they gave themselves to what God had given them. You might be a, I don't know, 30, 40 something year old woman with a good job like you thought maybe you'd be married and have kids by now and what are you going to do with that? This is your life. This is where God's placed you. What are you going to do with that? Maybe you lost your spouse and you find yourself alone. Okay? What are you going to do with that? God still has you here for a reason. And the reason is, is to use what he has given you to build the kingdom. As Denzel Washington said, to serve others. How cool is that? You got a breath in your life, you're still a role for you to play. You're still a job for you to do. Somebody needs you. What are you going to do with it? You fill in the blank. What's your story? But the thing is, especially when you see that maybe you're at the short end of the stick, are you going to gripe? Are you going to complain? Are you going to be making excuses? Or are you going to accept what is in your hands as coming from the Father in heaven and leverage it for his sake? Something bigger than yourself. And here's our conclusion. I think one of the most impacting verses in this passage is verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. One day, you and I will have to give an account 
for the life that God has given to us. It can be an awesome thing as depicted by the first two servants in the parable, or it can be another instance of excusing the blame. We all have some time, but we have uneven amounts of time. We all have opportunities, but we have uneven amounts of opportunities. So a person who can say, I'm taking responsibility for my life, really. That means you're going to be an individual who not only takes responsibility, but you're leveraging it for the best and the greatest. I'm not going to take my gifts and my talents that God has given me for granted. I'm going to utilize them. I'm going to stop comparing myself to these other people around me who have more or who have less. I'm going to take what God has given me and use that to his glory. The bottom line is simply this. To whom something is given, regardless of how great or small, something is required. It is when we embrace that and embrace it through the, the, the lens of a father, a heavenly father who loves us and understands us and knows how we're made and is giving us whatever bags he does because he knows that's what's right for us. Frankly, some of these guys that have one bag, some of these women that have one bag, and they've got the short end of the stick, but yet they're glorifying God. We couldn't be them. Some of us, we couldn't do it. They're strong. God made them resilient. God gave them certain abilities. Maybe you need to go one bag at a time. The God who loves us knows us best. He created us. He made us in who, into who we are for a reason. He made us on purpose for a purpose. And then he lets us go. So we have an example. Every week we celebrate communion, we celebrate the cross, and we celebrate that our heavenly Father is for us because we couldn't do it for ourselves. And he did the cross. Do you ever stop and realize he didn't need to do that and he would have remained righteous and holy because he would have been allowing us to pay for our own sins. But we couldn't. So he did. And every time we look at that, we're reminded that he did it for us. And he says, go and do likewise. And part of that means taking what we can do and leveraging it to the greatest we can. So, as I generally come and we share communion uh, there, you thinking about what is it that God has given you? And what is it that and how can you leverage that?